Okay. So, uh, we are here another day for another debate like here in the, at INIC. It's the second one. We have the uh, JavaScript framework first. And now we are heading into the debate of what uh, technology we should use in the mobile technology. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, I present myself. I'm a Robin Nolas. I'm a, an enthusiast on, on, tech, on mobile technology. I started a um, consultancy firm years ago that was focused mainly on mobile, on, on mobile uh, apps. Uh, we began working on uh, native, in a native way with iOS, then we switched to to uh, give some support on Android 2, and then we move, we we make a little step into hybrid apps. Um, so there is no discussion in here that mobile phones are the most used devices uh, now by users. But now, as developers or as a, as a tech team, we have to decide what technology to use. Um, we have several now. That first came the native apps, so we were forced to learn about the native technology. Then um, we have the hybrid uh, um, approach, with, uh, which led us to work with web technology. And, and now we are heading into the future, maybe, uh, with the, uh, some kind of progressive web apps, they say, that is like the hype right now. So we are here now to discuss that. So for uh, for this, we found um, experience, so experienced guys for defending every one of the <laughs> of every technology. And okay, first uh, let us word to Jordi Miro, uh, present yourself. Uh, he's um, he's uh, an entrepreneur, and he will be uh, defending the hybrid apps, right? Hello, uh, my name is Jordi Miro. Um, I've been building mobile apps since we built them with Java Mobile in 99. Uh, so I've been going through all kinds of flavors in mobile development. Nowadays, uh, launching a new service using hybrid applications. So I will try to do my best, even though I'm pretty sure I'm the less uh, technical one right now here, uh, to explain you why you should go uh, hybrid. Thank you. Then we have uh, Ruben Sospe Sospedra, who is a senior full stack engineer at Ulabox. Yep. And he will be defending native, you say. So. Right. So, hello, everyone. I'm Ruben Sospedra. I'm, as Harold said, a senior front end engineer at Ulabox, usually by Ulabox. It's an <laughs> online supermarket, very cool stuff. Uh, and at Ulabox, we actually do a lot of things in a lot of technologies. We have hybrid apps. We have the we, we are we have native apps uh, written in Android and iOS, and also we are building the new apps which uses React Native, then transpiles to uh, native code base. And for example, for the web, which is the main source uh, of finance uh, of the company, is just uh, PHP tweaks with jQuery. Uh, not fancy, but it works super well, so <laughs> that's where it matters. Uh, yeah, I'll be defending native. Uh, disclaimer, i am never developed in Objective-C nor Swift, but Android and React native a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, and the last one is Alessandro Zanardi, who is a CEO and founder at Codeworks, and he will be uh, defending that thing that they call progressive web apps. Yeah, um, yeah, I got the, the toughest one <laughs> to defend at the moment, yeah. Um, yeah, so just a quick word about Codeworks. Um, we, we met with um, our two other co-founders. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of the company. Um, and we wanted to create um, a coding bootcamp in Europe that was at the level of the past bootcamps in the US. How many of you know what a coding bootcamp is or have been to a coding bootcamp? A few, okay. All right, so basically the purpose of a coding bootcamp is to um, get people to start a career in tech as developers uh, as quickly as possible. So it's a very intensive educational experience where in our case uh, you work for three months, 11 hours a day, six days a week. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite mystical, some people call it, uh, right? Um, 
And uh, after that, usually you you come with uh, zero coding experience or a little bit of coding experience. There is a pre-course, there is a main course, and uh, then we we bootstrap um, your your tech career, connect you with companies. And so, for anyone who's interested to get into coding, get in touch with us. You find us online, codeworks.me, um, and we're here in Barcelona. Thanks. Okay, so very interesting lineup we have today. Uh, so. I will ask you to, f to make a first round uh, on every technology. So first, Jordi, uh, about the hybrid apps. Uh, what is to be to develop in hybrid? Uh, what are the pros and cons? And tell us about some technologies that help us getting to this approach. So, uh, and please, uh, don't hesitate to correct me if I'm saying anything that you know I'm lying or that I'm not saying correctly what it is. So, so uh, at the end, when, we, when we're trying to build mobile apps or web apps uh, using hybrid, uh, hybrid approach, what you want is to leverage on the HTML5 plus JavaScript libraries, SDKs, in order to, with one source code, being capable of deploying your application to multiple platforms. In a sense that it, do, it looks like native, even though it is not, and take the advantage of the distribution throughout um, throughout the app stores or yeah, throughout the app stores and uh, and try to gain speed because normally you, you might have burst uh, developers in, in in web technology so you can leverage on that you don't need to have the skills on on native um, but there are some cons uh, and I was saying before I used to be CTO at wacky.tv um, in our case we needed uh, DRM support. If you try to do that, there's only one way. So sometimes the discussion is pretty simple. It's business, it's technical, so just focus on what you need, how you want it built, and most cases you will find the right answer on which is the way to go. So if you ask me four months ago, hybrids were not the way, because we couldn't build what the business needed. In our case today, what we need is we wanted to be fast, we wanted to have access to WebGL or Canvas, and in that case, in order for a small team with limited knowledge on a lot of technologies, we said hybrid is the way to go. We want to build fast, reliable um, application to deploy in, in Android and iOS. And hybrid applications, as someone mentioned, it's, too, it's kind of 2015, 2014 might be. The good thing is that they are tested. They are tested and they are reliable. It's not like five years ago, seven years ago. No. You have a huge support, you have a huge community, you have amazing frameworks to work with, and if you want that, if you want speed, deployment, uh, one source code, I think you should go with it. Yeah, very nice. So, then we go with Native. Thanks. So, ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, uh, actually, one uh, note about it is like, uh, Ren will be uh, defending actually React Native as well. As yep. a native thing. Yep. Okay, so it's basically only... because it's native, you know. Yes. <laughs> yes, but the breaching is there. So I mean, if you have a dog, but you don't see the dog. You still have the dog, right? Yeah, but it's a, <laughs> th there is breaching technique, so it's kind of okay. it can be misplaced. So okay, so for React Native or native, uh, there are. I mean, it, it's it, I really into what Jordi said, uh, and every person of the products. Uh, the choice of the, not, not the technology like an abstract thing, but the framework, probably the language also, probably uh, the architecture. Your decisions as techies came from the business uh, development decisions, right? Because if you want to build, uh, let's move to our neutral territory. If you want to build, uh, I don't know, it's super fancy to make microservices, distributed microservices, but you actually need a monolithic application because you actually are developing a Magento e-commerce. So what are you doing, right? So first came the business. So once you have the business requirements, move on, make a kickoff, and then move on to the development process where the, in, in the best scenario, you will keep some stakeholders that they are gonna help you to make the iterations, technical iterations, right? So the process will be something like business says that we need to build apps, in my case, for example, a Tula box. Then I, uh, once I know that they want to have 
uh, both covering both uh, platforms, Android and iOS, and they are really into incrementing the revenue. Uh, we make a few tests with hybrid and later with native, and then we choose native uh, basically because the team feels more comfortable, right? That's another interesting quest, uh, point. If you have a team, you, are, you already have seven developers and they know JavaScript, then go React Native or, uh, uh, sorry, going hybrid or going progressive or going React Native makes sense, but do, don't go to Android or iOS because you will need to hire more people, right? So you, you also have a legacy in terms of people. That's super important. And moving into the technology, uh, the main downsides and are hard, <laughs> believe me, are basically all related to the continuous integration, continuous deployment, yada, yada, all the story, right? Because it's quite easy to have like a pipeline uh, that, that, that runs the test for a code which is designed to run in a browser because it's basically the most portable technology that we have right now. But once you are coding native, you are building for a very close environment, which is uh, the, the mobile, the device, right? So you have to mock up the environment, you have to, uh, well, connect all the pieces. If you're using React Native, you have the bridge, stay away of the bridge, it's dangerous. Uh, <laughs> And, and also the deployment. If you, are, if you are not using code push or technologies like that, which uh, allows you to um, change your code base in the app uh, in a way like uh, calling a, an API, something like that. If you're not using these kind of technologies, you are limited to the releases. You have to push your new code to the store, then have, you have to believe that the user is gonna download the new version, yada, yada. When you have a web or uh, progressive web application is the best, the best scenario. You just push something new to production and it's deployed. That's that's all. So I would say that those are the main downsides um, for me, and that's my very opinionated uh, statement. Uh, React Native have uh, something that is super cool. First of all, that it's React, React on the base. So it's not because I'm a React fanboy or something like that, but you have all the community and MPA models and all the stuff that's around the JavaScript community. So that's really cool. And also, you have the opportunity to build also your server with Node. So you can hire 10 JavaScript developers and you basically cover the web, the server, and the, and the apps. And this is, well, you're basically cutting the cost. Uh, I could be talking all the day, so I'm gonna <laughs> stop now. <laughs> yeah. uh, Alessandro. Uh, talk to us about what are progressive web apps and how you can approach this technique. Sure. Um, yeah, so one of the good things is that all the, or many of the app sites uh, that Ruben just shared with us are through also for progressive web apps, right? Uh, you can use React, uh, but you can also use Vue, or you can use Angular, or you can use Ember. Um, and you you can do your front end and back end with JavaScript. So there are some, some many of the pros I think are are shared between the two. So let's try to figure out what could be some guidelines for like when would you go for one or the other? Because I think one of the things that, that will probably emerge throughout the night is that like often in this kind of things there isn't one thing that's like okay guys. This is what you have to do, and if you don't do this, you're idiots. Like, no, it depends on on the, on your project, on the team size, on the requirements. So let's figure out what could be some criteria to uh, to decide what way to go. I, I've heard uh, mentioning uh, the the team size and the the resources, also economical resources you have. So the developers, what what the developers you're working with, know what technologies they're uh, they're familiar with, and what's your team like? How big is the team? Uh, what are the requirements of the app? What does it need to do? Uh, is it is it very intensive? Like is it a, is it a video game? Is it, is it intense uh, from point of view of like graphics or animations, or it's just like a crad? So, uh, which it's a technical term for whoever hasn't heard it before for just a, a typical app where you create, read, update, delete information, all right? Which is most of the apps out there. 
Um, so starting from this, then we can we can start uh, decide. Okay, uh, given our requirements, what is the tool that's more appropriate for for that? So now I'm I'm going to say what could be some of the pros of of using progressive web apps. Uh, how many of the people here are developers? Just to get an idea of like, all right, okay, a lot of developers. All right, guys, uh, how many people are working in a team of more than five developers in in your current job? All right, so most are small teams. That's interesting. That's interesting. All right, so yeah, that's, that's <laughs> kind of good for defending progressive web apps. All right, um, so uh, one of the things that, for example, um, is we, you came to this debate. You want to hear pros and cons. Uh, you you don't want to only hear happy people. So let's start to put some grit into the the, the debate. One of the things. So Ruben inspired me just just a moment ago, uh, saying about this this. Uh, the speed of the cycle of development. Um, so one of the things we notice, for example, in our course, so we have students building applications throughout the course. Uh, and in during every course, they build three applications, each student, all right? Uh, a personal one and, and group one. So we see them working as like developers individually and in group with other developers. And our instructors uh, are familiar, and we do we do React, we do just web apps, we do React Native. We don't do pure native. Uh, so like uh, Swift or, or Android, uh, but our instructors have worked with those technologies, so like we can compare it a little bit. Um, so one of the things, for example, that's kind of frustrating for developers, I've noticed over and over, is that uh, when they work with React Native, which is an amazing tool, so honestly, like I don't, don't think that I'm against React Native, I think it's, it's a great tool, but one of the inconveniences that I've noticed is that um, when you develop in the web, your iteration cycle is really, really fast. Like, say you want to release a new feature, bam, if you have continuous integration or continuous development, you ship it and it's out. And immediately your users will start using it. Not only that, even before that, while you're developing your app, right, uh, you can go and inspect things with that little Chrome developer tools that makes our lives so much easier to debug things and make it so much faster, right? And good luck with that uh, inside of the iOS simulator or whatever you're using for that. So yeah, but maybe you're a senior developer and you're not that worried about it because you have ways to debug that are as efficient and you're really good. But if you are in a, in a younger phase of your developer life uh, or, or growth, I mean, that, that will be a difference because sometimes you spend hours trying to figure out what uh, is not working in there. Or even to get an idea of like layout each time with like React Native and, and native apps, yeah, even more. Like you have to recompile everything until you see it there. So, especially in React Native, there's this situation in the middle where you don't have the integrated um, IDE. Like uh, you would have for, for example, the the iOS SDK, right? Um, so you're still working uh, with with the, the 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 app needs to be compiled, but you don't have a preview of what you're gonna see until it gets compiled and loaded in the device, right? So if you know like what is the size of this item, and then you ooh, oh, 50 pixels, and then you have to wait until it compiles, it runs in the device, and it shows it's like. All right, maybe 30 seconds, maybe two minutes, I don't know, depending how it comes. Each time you want to make a little modification, you have to wait those two minutes, and those add up in your development process. It's kind of frustrating, but there are also good sides. So uh, I'd say I don't, again, don't want to take too much time, but that's one of the things we notice that people get kind of frustrated over, like recompiling every time and having the thing reloading, and sometimes there are even bugs with the simulator and, and the app. So, and with progressive web apps, you just don't have to deal with that side of the complexity. There are other things we might mention later. So, I think we have big talkers in here, so I, I have a tough job today. <laughs> so, um, actually, actually, for you three, feel free to pick the mic and then respond immediately or trying to stop them or... Yeah, yeah, because Hello. actually I wanted to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I wanted. You. I wanted to ask you, Ruben, about. I'm sounding. Ah, okay, right. Yeah, you're it's just a Yeah, one, quick. One. No, super quick. It's not two minutes. It's like half second, and it's like hot model replacement, like like you do with Webpack. Uh, 
exactly. I mean, I walk every day, eight no. hours a day with React Native. It's like half second, and you have an inspector, which is not as cool as the Chrome devs, right? I, that's true, but you can debug all the logics, but not the, the views, because the views are actually a bridge, and the build, blah, 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 but it's like, I mean, 50. Yeah, you get the red screen that covers your app and gives you the... the that's why you're doing something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe it's a question for you, Ben, and you, Jordi, because uh, what about the window hell? I mean, when, when, when programming with React Native, uh, I think that's a known uh, problem that they have, because it's like Facebook actually had this problem with their developers, that when working with React Native, and I don't know in the hybrid apps, but you have like a lot of windows opened in there, it's like you have to use the editor, you have to have open the, um, the um, actually the Chrome with the inspector because you need it, and then the simulator, and then Xcode opened. So what happens with this? Uh, I, I have the simulator, and then I have like, a, it's a Chrome uh, browser, no? Like in, with the dev tools open, so you have the, the logs, everything is bridged here. Then you have the editor, which I think is normal. Uh, if you're using Beam, you just have the terminal with everything. So you, you don't need to have the Xcode open. Oh, okay. So you have the window hell is that you have uh, actually, actually, one I'm more referring... window, one more window, which is a simulator. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm lost now because I'm referring to a problem that Facebook actually said about it, and, and they recognized that they had the problem in uh, F8 event. So. Honestly, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, okay. actually, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they're no, 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 but wrong. Uh, for real, I mean, <laughs> everyone uh, create native apps, then you just build the Hello World. You don't need the S code to have it open to to develop. When you have, to, when you want to build, then you have yeah. to open the S code and build. But you have fast fast lane, fast lane dot tools, uh, which you got, you can optimize everything. You don't need the S code even install. You don't need the the each code build essentials tools, whatever. I don't know the name. So uh, I don't know maybe You're maybe they, no, but I mean maybe they are doing something which is m m more yeah, more complex or, but I don't know we are building an e-commerce at the end, right? Very yeah. well built, built, but it's an e-commerce. Maybe they are doing something super good. Well, they are social uh, social <laughs> network, but I don't know. Okay, okay, and then um, okay, so let's talk about some developer concerns about these technologies. Like, what about the performance? Uh, and I like the word for everyone that wants to take it. I think, I think that's easy, you know. In, in any benchmark you read, you want performance, you go native, period. The problem is how much is that percentage of real Im improvement in performance that any of our application needs? So it's like, in, in general, performance, only 1% one, one, 1 of our apps or webs have performance issues due to traffic. So you have to be very, you have to push the boundaries of your application too much in order to say that performance is the, the decision to go one way or the other. Maybe, yes, if you're doing hard ga games that need a lot of graphics, this and that, I, I would say that's a very clear way to decide which technology to use. But if not, Perform, average performance, that is what most of us need, can be achieved in any of those. So I th would say that performance, unless you go to one of the extremes that you really need that, would, for me, it would not be the key, this key decision maker. I, I very much agree. I mean, um, unless your app deals with um, like streams of data, you're you're doing uh, something like live editing, some videos, or some very intense like animation, lots of effects. No, I'm not talking about simple like shades and and scrambling, like like a, like a video game with lots of graphics and 3D rendering, um, or even sound, something with sounds like DJing or like apps in that direction that might need or effects, something where where time. Rendering like CPU uh, response is crucial. 
otherwise, I, I don't think you'd run in any particular issues. Never, and we've not had issues with the exception of, I've heard some apps built with Ionic in the hybrid world that had uh, some issues um, more. And I've heard also that Safari is doing better than Chrome on this, which is kind of surprising because Chrome is kind of leading the way in, in, in many other ways. But actually on, on mobile devices, it looks like Safari um, kind of eats uh, these apps better than, than, than Chrome, like significantly. But still, uh, outside of those areas, I, I haven't heard um, of problems. Yeah. I, I agree with everything, just, uh, well, and clearly, if you want to build a video game, probably just go to native, because you don't know, uh, you know the future of your game, where, what's the limit, and so on. But just one thing, there, there is, there is uh, uh, with progressive web applications, you can use Service Worker, which is a technology uh, very easy to use that you can, it, it can boost your performance very well. And I'm not defending progressive, but it's really cool, the, the Service Worker per cache and the Service Workers uh, per se, they are very powerful technologies. Uh, especially because we can be talking about performance in terms of GPU, CPU, that's one thing, and then we can be talking about performance in terms of uh, loading time, right? So the cache is basically, after you load it, the next time is gonna be instant. And that's another kind of performance. Thank you, Ruben, for that. You're welcome. <laughs> no, but what I, I was going to say is that I, I, I'm having a very bad time now, because it's like, I feel like that this debate is like participant versus moderator. And it's like, they are joining forces. It's come on. It's like, OK, I, no, I'm going to do this uh, um, uh, not so nice thing here that is the app install friction. So what happens with this? So I mean, the app install friction is that, that friction that the user have in order to, from, from the user reaches to your app in the App Store, for example, until it becomes an active user. OK? So what about this? And the friction of adding a shortcut to your phone in order to get to that progressive web app? Are you saying that so, is so huge? There's, there's friction. The friction is there. Because in order to conquer a user... I made it. I made it. No, in order, no, I think that the problem is in order to get a user, and all of you, even if you're in the tech world, you know that your marketing team and your business team is always reminding you which is the cack of a user and so, you have that <laughs> any way you build your app. So you have the friction of installing. At the end, we all have a lot of applications on the phone, but normally you use very little of them. So the problem is how, and I don't think that it is a problem on, on installing the app versus the web, progressive web application and how I get to that. It's a problem is, which is the value of your application so you're dealing with that friction. So build it, it would be the same. Anything to that? Uh, yeah. The problem is the store. <laughs> for, me, for me the problem is the store and yeah, the, we're, we're the, 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 store. the store and the process to go through the store. But that's why if you go hybrid, uh, there are a lot of things that you would not care because you go through it, through it less times than what you would do in completely native. Well, um, I mildly disagree with this. Obviously, I'm here to defend progressive web apps, so I got I to gotta throw some, some, something in there. All right. Uh, so it depends. it depends on your case. But if, if, if you consider uh, the case where... Um, you already have a website. So let's say uh, your, your company has a website out. Um, it's a news website or, or it's, it's whatever, whatever you're doing. But you already have traffic to that website, right? Um, and it's, it's, this is very, very common that all these companies that had websites all of a sudden felt like um, that they had to add to have an app, a mobile app, right? So they started like creating all these mobile apps for everything that we were consuming on the web already. So how many people really install the app for those things? It's, it's kind of rare, because you, you go to the website, and that, that, that's enough. You know, and if they want to convince you to install the app, it costs them, like uh, Google's calculated it, about $3 per user average. So depending on your app, it might be higher or lower. Um, all right, so if you already have users coming to, to your web and using and consuming it, then um, when, when I think when Google was leading the way in, in, this, in this area, they thought like, 
if you have users that are recurring, come to your website often enough, uh, then why don't propose them to have that on your desktop so that you can send them push notifications, you can give them a better mobile experience because with service, service workers, the app will load immediately, will have a cache content, it can handle if you're offline for some time. So it's like, it's like your website on steroids, right? It's like, right, yeah, I mean, the, 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 you're like making the line thinner between the, an actual app, like a mobile app, and the website now it's becoming like like an app, you know, kind of dress up uh, and and offers more features, and where that that border is becoming thinner and thinner as we go through time. So I think the case is, if you already have a website and you already have uh, uh, users going there, then there is way less friction, in my opinion for users to install a progressive uh, web app because the, the, the device itself proposes the user, hey, why don't, you, why don't you want a better experience? And what would you say? Yeah, I want a better experience. <laughs> and so, and so you, you install it. You don't have to go to the store, find it, download it. Oh my god, this app is 80 megabytes. And then every two weeks, they're releasing an update. And now on my iPhone, every, every six weeks, I have to download three gigabytes of data because there is 50 apps that I need to update, like, that is as a nightmare, right? And then you end up using the same three, four apps all the time. Um, so, so that's kind of a smoother uh, process. You don't have people that like get cut off uh, along the way, more user engagement. It helps you push notifications to users that might be consuming uh, your website, so I would say. Uh, let me make some trouble. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, uh, all, all, I mean, Progressive is always going like uh, a step behind native just because the time that we are. It's, a, it's the new kid on the block and it's a very immature technology and that's, this is fine. This is fine. Uh, but the, 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 <laughs> the, service, the, the, service, the service workers at the end, they are just trying to replicate that with the native applications and hybrid applications, you already have the information in your mobile, yeah. physically in the, in the hard disk. So, I mean, it's cool, but it's a step back. And, and about the friction, uh, I think that we have to make a statement very clear. It's the new kit on the block, and I have two official information. One is from Nielsen, and the other one from Fluri Analytics. Uh, it's from Yahoo, Fluri. And it's basically that Nielsen says that 80, 86% of the media consumed in mobiles came from native apps. And Flory says that just the 10% of the time that the person is using their phone, they are using a browser. So this is yeah. right now. I, I believe that, but it's always the same two apps. It's like YouTube and, and WhatsApp and Facebook five. and Instagram. Yeah, actually like, five. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's those apps and like, yeah, it's, those are native. Okay, but what about all the other apps? But you are still using it, right? You use those five ones, but since like I don't think like everyone in the world works and at how, YouTube, how many or websites WhatsApp there are or, in the world? Or Instagram or like I don't know, but <laughs> millions, <laughs> millions of websites, right? So I mean, th this is another statistic. If you want to compare, you have to to use the same method, right? So the, first, we are saying that if you are, I mean, having all the time, the user is on the phone. We have ten percent for the browser, ninety percent for native apps. So. If you want to compare with this, then we should say, if you have an app, which is, I don't know, one year old application, how many of these timeshare it has? Compared to, if you have a website, say, one year website, how many of your browser share it has? That, that will be, I don't know the numbers. I don't know the numbers, but it's difficult. I agree. Well, I the, agree. the companies that try to transition got a 400% uh, increase in traffic in, in the worst case. One, one typical case is the Washington Post who created the progressive web app and, and it was like one of the use cases uh, that was published kind of everywhere. And, and uh, yeah, they had, a, they had a huge increase in user engagement and cons consuming content and, and things. So, so the, the companies app, that or, or, didn't or have it... The desktop website against against the website against the website, which is where most users were going. Maybe maybe the native app yeah, would be maybe, better. Maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe yeah. Okay, so changing changing topics, maybe. Okay. Um, I read about some interesting topic. I, I mean, reading because of this debate. I read about that the Steve Jobs' initial idea is that at first iPhone 
because first mobile uh, smartphone or whatever you call it that didn't have an app store because he strongly believed that to the developers to make webs I mean apps for the iPhone using web standards okay and this I read about Forbes listed that as one of the biggest mistakes of Apple and then they moved back in not moved back but they met at the App Store and then Google Pay came and whatever. So the initial idea was to make it from web standards and then install apps from there. So turning um, because Steve Jobs was a hippie at heart. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, turning with that, I will make you one question: Is App Store and and Google Play Store I don't, is is a global App Store good or evil? If you get rejected, very bad. <laughs> I think that here I would say, and we're, we're talking about mobile. If you consider that mobile web store or app stores are bad, go to smart TV app stores. That's even worse. <laughs> so so uh, and the, the Android is pretty easy, no? You just push and, and it is there. The problem is when you push iOS and you have to deal with these people in Bangladesh who are testing your application, no disrespect to them because they're from Bangladesh. No, don't, don't get me wrong. The issue is it's, so, it's a black box and we don't like black boxes at anything because that's why in our case, in hybrid applications, you go through there very little. You have to go there, but it's the minimum, yeah. at least once. If, yeah. if, if, you're, if the way you design your application, you're smart enough, you go once. So that's a problem that other has. And progressive don't have it, they have another problem. But um, you have to deal with the App Store once and with their criteria, which is a human criteria in most cases. And when, even if you're very big, there is no phone you can grab and say, and I used to work for Rakuten, who is the third largest e-commerce company and blah, 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 blah. When we had a problem, it didn't matter. It comes to human relationships and you phone a friend you have in Apple who happens to know someone, but, uh, and, and they even had to have this, this, this flag to say, I need a fast, a fast approval. It didn't happen years ago. So deal with the App Store. It's an uncertainty that your business guys hate. I'm going to release tomorrow. Are you sure? No. Okay. But not only in, 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 I mean, in the review process, or something like this, but in terms of promoting or in terms of being there, if you are no one, because you can be listed on the first positions or you can have like, access to that at a fast track to another uh, to, to some reviewer from the App Store or something like this, and then you got a fast track into the first dashboard of the App Store. But if not, it's good, it's bad. Can I? Yes. Because it, it, here the answer is quite easy. You have to choose drown into the ocean or drown into the sea. That's the only difference. Because it, it's, it's super difficult. There are a lot of competitive uh, com competition. If you're in the market, it's, it's right that the market, at, at the end, it's, it's a platform, right? And it's a marketing platform. Because you are basically uh, going through a funnel, right? My app is about uh, finance. Therefore, I be, I, I'll be not in the website, competing with all the websites in the world, but I'll be in a Play Store. And inside the Play Store, I'll be in the category of finance. Uh, if I do, I, I, I mean, I don't need to have a lot of downloads. I just need to appear first in the, in the first 500, and then start working on this. I mean, it's something that you have that is like with checkpoints, right? So th that's better. Bad side, all the review process that Jordi say, I, I've read once that uh, in the States, I don't, I don't remember the company, but they made a, an experiment with the Apple Store. They just basically pushed the same app like 11 times, and at the 12th time, they actually published it. So it was completely random. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, quick, a quick note is that Apple, Apple has uh, shortened this, this review process a lot the last year. And I don't know if some of these technologies or, I mean, 
I'm sure something is related to it, but I don't know what is related to it. Uh, before, the review process was like one week long, okay? And we were very happy when the review t took like five days. You were like, you, you, feel, you felt important. <laughs> and it's like... And you were rejected, yeah. Yeah, no, of course, but no, no. No, no iOS developer has, I mean, you are not an iOS, a true iOS developer if you haven't been rejected once, so. But, 100 a day, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that determines the level of, of, the, of, of what developer are you. So, but now the review process is one day. So I think they're using more machine learning behind it. Like there is less less people in Bangladesh, like you said a moment ago, and more more computers uh, doing doing tests, and that that's uh, sped it up a lot. And 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 there are some edge cases when they're undecided, still human, but they're they're I think um, increasing the number of things that are automated, and that gives the speed. That's my guess. I'm, I I I don't know. I haven't actually talked with Apple with about Apple this. Apple is just guessing. Yeah. So it's just my guess. Yeah. So. Maybe uh, changing maybe your answer uh, about this topic that you were discussing here. Yeah, but, I want to let, let, make, let yeah. me make another question because it's like yeah. kind of related to privacy web apps because Apple right now is yeah, the. I was, I was going there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. 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 Let's so do it. Let's do it. Let's Apple is the biggest wall yeah. against privacy web apps yeah. because uh, I mean Google is pushing it and and Chrome is 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 supporting privacy web apps, but. All the market is waiting for for Apple to make Safari support progressive web apps, implementing access to to, to service workers, <laughs> push notifications, and what's happening with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great question. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I was about. Apps, um, so. Yeah, it's it's better. So I'm gonna make this auto goal because it's it's better uh, to to like say what's the main problem at the moment uh, and, and not wait until they're going to bring it out and, and, and kill me on this. So the main, the main problem that progressive web apps have at the moment is that um, Safari doesn't support, doesn't fully support service workers, all right? Um, so that kills a lot of the purpose of progressive web apps. Um, so um, and, and it doesn't support the manifest, the, the, the JSON manifest. So the, the integration with Safari is, I would say, very shaky at the moment. Not, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't do what gives them the main purpose of having progressive web apps, right? So Chrome supports it. Firefox is embracing it, uh, and it's improving. Yeah, yeah. Firefox. Firefox? Hmm? Firefox. 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 Yeah, yeah. Firefox. I thought they were out of business already. No, no, no. They're and they're embracing for Fire, Firefox on mobile. Yeah, Firefox. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. <laughs> they're they're embracing progressive web apps. Um, and uh, and Safari for the moment is not. Although for the first time recently, they put on a, on the next five years plan. That if the community ends up uh, going progressive web apps, they will include them in Safari. So, I mean, they know that they can't go too much against the current on this. But my impression is that obviously there is politics and there is business in this. Like, mm, if you think about it, uh, if progressive web apps grow in terms of uh, distribution, um, it's not particularly in favor of, of Apple at the moment. I mean, because because the the app uh, the app store it's a big asset for Apple. How much do they get in commissions of the sales of the apps that get sold there? So if you move a lot of those apps out of the app store and move them into progressive web apps, it's a loss basically for for Apple in economical terms, in in control, in in power in general. So I don't know if they can really enter this debate in in a, in a neutral position or like, oh yeah, let's see what's the best technology out there. So I I think they have strong interests at 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 play and understandably. Um, on the other hand, to say something positive about it, I think some people have appreciated the fact it's the eternal debate of like the walled garden, right? Apple has always had this strategy of like making things more closed, but for the people that like Apple, uh, in, with a better user experience, more filtered, more controlled, better, uh, more polished, more clean, etc. So. Um, so that, you know, the, the people that would defend the App Store uh, could say that at the same time there was like more quality of the apps that are there, they're reviewed, they're controlled. So pros, pros, pros and cons. But um, for people that just love the, the freedom of the internet and the fact, I mean, the web is, is built on this, um, on the possibility for anyone to just 
bring your voice out and 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 then let the public decide is this is this worth my attention or not is this interesting is it bad is it good uh, there is no one else making that decision for you so far and i hope it's going to stay like that for for some time so in this case i'm i'm more uh, politically more in favor of of progressive um web apps and i and i hope safari will embrace it and and then let the public decide what what they prefer so oh we have a question Yeah, uh, we. Thanks for the question. I was I was <laughs> checking that, uh, knowing that it could it could come out as a question. So you can you can do that through to the web. So the the Apple Wallet uh, API and, and Google Pay allows you to um, to put like uh, a meta tag in your in your web page, and if the device supports payment. Uh, you can do the transaction. So it will check that you have like a credit card in your Apple wallet and the device supports that. And when a user clicks on like pay now or whatever, it will go through the, the native uh, device payment procedure. So that's actually nice. It works already. And it works on, uh, on iOS devices already. Maybe it works because they are getting some money from it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was just about to, talk, to start talking about this because basically I, I have I want to tell you two stories, short. First is the. Got it. So we're heading uh, after this. We're heading to the questions. So, but it's it's uh, I think it's quite interesting both of them. First of all is the story of the technical committee of the web standards. I don't remember the name. TJ thirty nine. I think is the name. Uh, and what's the problem with the progressive right now? And it's basically, uh, for a second, put you in the in 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 the boots of Apple, right? So you are a big company. You're making thousands of millions of dollars every year, and basically, like, 60% of your revenue revenue comes from the App Store. So why you should make anything? Period. Not not anything good. Not anything. Don't move. Right? I mean, you are actually doing the business. Uh, so the technical committee, uh, like two years ago, start, started to make a lot of improvements on the APIs, on the HTML5 APIs and so on, and the ECMAScript committee also, and well, all this stuff. And they push the service worker, they push the pre-cache, they push the push notifications, which is the, here can, comes the debate now. Right, the push notifications is one of the big assets of the native apps. That's super important. Uh, maybe not for the techies, it's hard to understand, but for the marketing people, it's basically a free window to the user, whatever time, whatever uh, the user is. You, I mean, you have a lot of information uh, related also with geofencing and that kind of stuff, which is basically metric the position of the user. And, and so on, all, all this stuff which you can only do if you have an open standard for the web or the native. And then push notification brings the debate because in iOS you can actually make uh, push notifications without doing some tricky things yeah. from a web, right? Obviously with the native, yes, but from the web. And, and, and this is a super blocker. This is a super blocker. So what Apple said, I will open the push notifications on iOS when you make me the payment API. So like two months ago, if I don't remember but the technical committee say, okay, we're gonna develop the payment API and you're gonna open the iOS push notifications API. Therefore, this is probably the, the start of the way to progressive web applications. I don't want to uh, stab me in the back, but <laughs> but that that's true. And what Alex say is, is right about the open of the internet. Uh, that's one story. And the second story is what this about the technical committee means in a startup, in a company already. So this is the case of Eulabox. When I joined Eulabox, my first uh, task job, whatever, uh, it was to transform the Eulabox.com into a progressive web application. And that was the first idea. What happened? We found the limitation of the push notification, the limitation of the uh, payment API, and so on, and more complexity related with the iOS. And then we go to our metrics, and we say that we, we saw that like 85% of our revenue comes from Apple uh, users. Uh, 
Uh, then we, in, at November, yeah, October, November, something like that, we make the decision to go to React Native and make native apps because you, you, you cannot just, because it's super trendy and the new kid on the block, cut 80% of your revenue. So that, that are the two stories. You have something that is super trending, it's super cool, and probably, probably, <laughs> probably, in the future, it, it's gonna be like the default, right? But right now isn't. Isn't in terms of uh, uh, user time, share, whatever. Isn't in terms of market. Isn't in terms of functionalities. Isn't now. So probably all the people that's here, you're building your business now, not in 2019. <laughs> So well, that, that's too far. I think. I hope it. I hope it. Uh, Apple say next in year. the five next years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The keys and push notifications. Actually, this is why we say that the key of of progressive web apps yeah. remains relays on Apple. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course. Like once you have uh, you have you have payments, so you you have push notifications, you have service service workers, then. Again, this borderline between between a native app and so the the, the reasons because we all agree that it takes more effort to to develop uh, a native a native app, um, especially if you want to go on on both devices, Android and and iOS. I would say because of course, like you gotta work with different languages, you have to maintain two code bases, you have to push to the store, you have a development process that's a little more complicated. Anyways, more 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 effort, more expensive. Um, so if you take off the advantages of going one way or the other, then it, most of the times you would be more inclined to to go that. So what are what are factors that that we could consider? Um, now I completely agree with what Ruben said. If you if you're building an app today in production, all right, and you want to make sure that it works on Android and iOS, I would go React Native or Native. Uh, the main problem you would have with uh, progressive web apps is uh, on iOS devices. That's where you would have most pain. If you just want to target Android devices, then then I would be w more. Would you go for one platform only? More consider. Yeah, I mean there are people that that just release an app. It, sometimes also you might want to start releasing an app to one audience and then decide on. You know there is a lot of business cases. You know sometimes you want to see how that works. You want to get it out fast, see how many users you get, and then decide. Um, in the future, hopefully this will change. Maybe it's going to be faster. It, it does depend on, on Apple. Another aspect that we haven't talked about, I think it's, it's quite important and fa fascinates me. Um, I also love user experience. I don't know for how many of you are into UX. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a big topic. Um, I'm just going to throw it out. Um, when you go web apps, right? so progressive or not, uh, the app di dictates the UI, right? So it's the app that, that chooses what uh, and how the user should use it. When uh, you go native, uh, whether it's pure native or it's React native or whatever, then you embrace the operating system uh, UI. So that's not entirely clear. I mean, good practice says so far that it makes it more comfortable for the user if you follow the operating system UI because they're already familiar. But there are apps that are so much used and if they end up, they can get to a power position where they will almost dictate the UI themselves, right? Because you're so used to have it that way. And in a way, I, I mean, even the operating system, if you look at how, for example, the, the Apple operating system has evolved, they have tried to bring the two UIs very much together. You know, you start seeing now notifications on your desktop that have like the gray background, like on the mobile, and you're like, "What's well, not necessary? Why they're doing it? Because they, they want to make it other, feel the same." So yeah, they're copying each other, so they yeah, are, yeah, going in the same direction. The so eventually, that I think that is a very interesting consideration: who is going to lead uh, the UI? Is it going to be the operating system, or is it going to be? The, the app developer and what users are going to prefer and that's yeah. that's interesting if you do if you do use progressive web apps and want to be consistent with the operating system thing then you requires a little extra effort I think I guess you can all guess how that it's more painful because you have to detect what device the person is using and then 
provide two different type of, of interfaces based based on that. When, um, when we when we get when we get then to progressive web apps, the discussion will be bootstrap or material design then and that. Yeah. So it's like, so no, I, I finished. It, that was my comment. That. <laughs> So may I answer or is because I think the at Dollabox we are right now doing this and it, it's not really something about uh, who who leads but the learning curve of the users. If we are uh, doing the same patterns again and again and again for the user, it's super easy to to start uh, exploring your application, right? I mean, if I show you three parallel horizontal bars on the top left of the screen, you will understand that if you press there, then a drawer will appear, right? So this is a pattern at the end. We try to replicate these patterns. And what is true is that you have different patterns on iOS and uh, on Android. For example, in iOS, there is no hardware back button. That's a pain in the whatever. And <laughs> the, ju ju just this thing. And what, what is true is that if you're doing native, you can access the native components, which they are already uh, styled in the native way, right? So I mean, if I get a spinner in Android or in iOS, the, the, it's already styled. It, 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 it loops like uh, Apple wants or Android wants. That's yeah. less work to do at the end. How difficult is to break what users are used to? And I think that, and I think that yeah, yeah. If, if you're really, really big, you can set up your own, uh, your own ways of going. Yeah. The problem is for most of us, we're very small. So we need to stick to what the user normally is used to, uh, rather than trying to. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think uh, there are some some things where everyone would agree, like that's kind of a design pattern that's working and the user is familiar with. There are other cases where maybe the ch choice is not that uh, obvious because maybe the user is used to your website that has that thing in that way and doesn't want when they go to the mobile having it in a completely different place. So they have also to consider that transition from the website to the mobile app, and not only from one mobile app to another mobile app, just to know what the factors at play are. And so that's, that's for consideration of the developer and the team each time to, to make, I think. Right, yes. Consistency. Very, very, fa very fast. Super fast. Consistency, he's right. If you are in, in this trouble, go to analytics and see if you have more mobile traffic, mobile leads the way, and if, if not, it's desktop. Okay. Nice. So, Question. questions? Um, There's a the mic. Oh, okay. Um, how do you control the, um, the quality and the security without the filtration which the app store provides you with? Uh, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, meaning, well, uh, one of the things that Progressive Web Apps um, has done to improve in this area is that um, all the apps that want to have the Progressive uh, Web Apps advantages need to be served through HTTPS and a, <coughs> a valid TLS certificate. So that is one step in that direction. So like, at least you know that the information that's passed between the app and the server should be secure and, you know. Um, so, so that is to protect the user to a certain extent, right? Um, there is no filtering, so that's 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 the web. I mean, that's the web. Like, who can can you publish a website that's bad? If it's super bad, people eventually <laughs> will come after you at some point, depending what you do and how relevant you are. But like, so there is no there is no censorship at the beginning. On the API, I mean, when using some progressive web apps, I think that there is some checklist that you have to that you have to embrace. That, and one of the things is that you have to use HTTPS. Yeah, you do. You and do, yeah. if you're not using it, it, you cannot use the API that the progressive app. Or is it web app exposes? Who's not using HTTPS? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. Okay, I will say that yeah. everyone no, is using HTTPS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, nice. I'm saying, what I'm saying not is is not because of this uh, specific thing, but exactly. that they have like some tools to protect the user yeah. against that. That's all the other thing. So more questions? Okay, no questions. I'm surprised. Yes. I have a question for uh, Why would you choose React over real native? It's a matter of the team that you have, 
matter of maintaining the code base. I, I like the thing on React, on, on real native. <laughs> okay, I got it. Uh, at at Dulabox, it was uh, first because of the team, right? We already have uh, three JavaScript developers, uh, counting me. And second, and most important, because the speed of development. Okay, so you're going, uh, if you want iOS and uh, Android, you have to develop twice the same code base. And here, also, that uh, a thing that I want to share with everyone is that you actually have a pathway from React Native to the progressive web applications. Because for us, for example, that we're using uh, like all the fancy uh, stuff, right? Relax, sagas, and everything. Uh, the sagas, the containers, the actions, the reducers, the logics, the router, everything is just JavaScript. It's not coupled to React Native, just the views. So we can, and we actually did, and we tried, and it works. Uh, we can have our, say, but button dot Android dot JS button dot iOS dot JS button dot web dot JS. If you are at web, it's going to load the button, and everything works. So you can actually use React Native as uh, an extra tool to build iOS, Android and web. So I, I'm not advocating this for production now. Not, not now, but, but in the very close future, for sure. That, that's, for sure. that's something that we at the Box, um, we, have, we, we tested, we experimented with this, and it, and it works. It's not in production, but once we have it in production, I would say go, go on because it's easy, and you can share like 80% maybe of your code base. It's always the same, it, there are the logics, which is the complex thing also, and just makes the, the same view for different technologies. And there is also a repository from Nicholas Gallagher called React Native Web, uh, which intends to do this thing automatically for you, so you can check it out. So, we have, do you want to? No, just sorry? real quick, one of the things that I, I want to mention that um, was coming up in previous days, like chatting about this, also, I mean, it's kind of um, against the entire uh, discussion here, but um, one of the things to consider is like, do you really need a, 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 an app? Like, consider if you actually need one, because it's not obvious that it like, make that consideration, because sometimes maybe a, a, a good web or web app or whatever, it's, it's, it's enough. I mean, just something that before you enter all the process of developing, shipping, and doing, does that, is that important for your business? Will it drive more value? Because I have a feeling that there are way more apps out there than, uh, that probably are actually used and bring value to, to the user. And lots of websites that have apps that people just never use. They just go to the website. And so. So we have a last question that is, um, is a question that was posted on the Meetup website, on uh, the Meetup website. And it comes from Nowis. It's uh, saying native versus uh, progressive web apps is not so much about tech, but more about user behavior. Are users ready to add to home screen a website instead of installing an app? I, this is kind of related. But I but think it's a little bit what we've discussed. What you mentioned friction, and then when we were discussing, I think it's a matter of how you acquire that user. And yes, you, you can push them, and um, the Washington Post is a, it's, it's a great uh, example, but we, we do the same with native hybrid applications that you download. We push the user in order to download the application. And I remember this very well when we were doing it at Wacky. One of the things was, if you have a, if we didn't have a mobile application, you couldn't watch content. So the purpose of, right. in that business, which is a business decision, yeah, uh, you want to watch movies. Uh, the, so, the advantage, so, the advantage of, of progressive web apps is that the operating that, system does it for and, you. And, and not only not only that, you skip the you skip the the process, you skip several clicks. But but at the end, uh, there's friction, and friction is going to be there. Yeah. But one thing is having that amount of friction, and one thing well, is having no, this, this no, 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 because if you if you drive them directly to your application, the friction is one more click. Well, but for, first you have to to put in 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 place the process to to ask the user about it, and the user so I really want and, and I will then, and I will charge them you, in any platform. Yeah, yeah well then then you need to go there, then you need maybe you're not signed up in the in the store. And then you forgot the password, then something, and, I, yeah, I, and every grade, I, I, like people I, I, just I, like, ah, just, I, totally I don't need it. this app. Give me iOS and we will discuss it. 
I was first. Is, is Nisha the name? It, it, it's a difficult name. Yeah, yeah, it's sorry. Nisha. I'm sorry. Nisha Golden. I'm yeah. sorry, Nisha. Uh, and and then about the friction, I, I don't think that it's about the one more click or whatever, but it's about what we talked before: the, uh, user experience, right? I I always think in my mom. My mom knows how to install an application through the Play Store, but w once she enters in a website and then appears l something that looks like a pop-up that says "Add to Home Screen," it's like uh, w she called me, right? <laughs> it's like, what's this? What, what should I do? So it's about UX. It's not about what? one click or, or not. What did you say? 